All righty, uh, Old Roller Nation, welcome to the show. Uh, strength coach extraordinaire, author, and uh, really cool guy, uh, Dan John. Dan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for the invite. This worked out very easily, very quickly. This is nice, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm glad uh, we, we try to make it easy, but uh, we don't always get it right. But we definitely want to be a, uh, a good show to the guest, at least. Good. Well, let's get, let's, let's jump in. Absolutely. So, uh, to kind of give you the uh, uh, the purpose of this this podcast, I started this show uh, just before my 40th birthday, and uh, I'm a jiu-jitsu uh, practitioner, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and uh, on the call with us here on the, the show is uh, my instructor, Michael Seals, and uh, one of the, the elements of jiu-jitsu is it's a rare fighting art that you can do uh, into an elevated age, uh, because we don't get hit in the head a lot. There's not a lot of CTE risk. And, uh, so the purpose of this podcast is to explore from physical therapists, nutritionists, strength coaches, uh, high level jujitsu practitioners and competitors, ways of developing the most skill, maintaining that skill for the longest time. So we want to roll dangerously into our twilight years, we, we say. And uh, so you're one of the people that has had a huge influence on me specifically. Uh, just when I started strength training, a friend uh, told me to, to read D uh, Dan John stuff on T Nation. And uh, that set me on a path that has really, really helped. And I found somewhat obviously to me now that I look at it, you know, 10 years from, uh, uh, in reverse, that my philosophy of skill acquisition in jujitsu was highly influenced by your works because you had had such an influence on me as a strength trainee. And so I put a lot of those methods into it place. Should, to it should be all the same. I mean, they true. I mean, I think that's the mistake we make in, in my world is we try to make it very Harry Potter, very magical, very mysterious. We're really, honestly, it's, it's getting into the gym those three days a week for 156 workouts a year, you know, uh, it's taking care of business, those three work, and, and just keep coming back, showing up. Uh, and I'm sure with, with your martial art, it's the same truth. You know, mm -hmm. people come in and they want to learn uh, how to, you know, use the Vulcan death grip uh, on day one. True, right? They want, just tell me a couple things I need if I ever get into a fight in the bar. Just show me those three things. Well, yeah, okay. I mean, I feel that same way. People just want... Yeah, I just want to have six pack abs, really broad shoulders, be really cut, and oh, okay, yeah, give me, uh, I get, give me an hour, you know. <laughs> I, I got, I got a program for that, you know. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's universally the same truth. So yeah, and I, I think what you said there has has definitely been a key sort of uh, overarching concept of the show is like all these great coaches and everything. Uh, the first lesson, both in skill and longevity has been consistency. If you show up, you will improve and you also will be safer uh, because the body uh, doesn't react well to uh, big changes in volume and intensity, such as coming to jujitsu for a couple of months, quitting, coming back to jujitsu for a couple of months, quitting uh, things like that sort of set you up for injury and uh, injury is a big bugaboo in, in you know this sport. It, it's hard to be on the mat if you're if you're busted up. Yeah. Well, and when's the right time to put on a seatbelt? Well, it's every time you sit down in your car. What's a good day to floss? Every day is a good day to floss. What's a good day to get a good night's sleep? It, and the truth is, when you start packaging these smart quality experiences over and over and over, magically, I, I always tell people respect the process. You know, the results will take care of themselves. And people, when they fail, what I've noticed is they don't they don't truly respect the process as much as they should. Uh, they're trying to, you know, this this idea of being eight percent body fat and fighting in a in a, in a tournament. I, I don't know, just threw two things together. Uh, really, if you just do the, the you you can't worry about the results. The results are the results. You might be that you might be in the best shape of your life, and still just get destroyed on the mat because someone's just better. Mm -hmm. Flat out, they're just flat out better. They're a longer background, better DNA, and just better. And uh, but if you did, if you respect the process, you're the best you can be, and that's okay. 
and that's okay. That's that's something I've, I I try really hard in the world of throwing and well track and field. <sighs> DNA is so important, and but you can still improve. You can still you can still be pretty darn good if you respect the process and you do the basics. Yeah, there's, there's a. It's funny that you say that too, uh, because we talk a lot about the basics of jujitsu or the fundamentals in this show, and in certain ways, because it's it's a very broad sport, it's it's hard to kind of pin down what is a basic and what's a fundamental, uh, because there's so many different paths that you could take to become good. Uh, and you could be really good, say, with a guillotine choke, which is you know reaching over someone's head, or you could be really good with a rear naked choke, which is reaching around someone's head. But they're both chokes, you know. So there's there's complexity within the simplicity at times uh, that I think is difficult to navigate. And that's why it's part of your job as a coach is to find those good people who say, like John Heisman about American football, walk, tackle, and fall on the ball. Well. I mean, I coached football a long time, and I, I, I will go back and I say it's funny because this game was lost because we didn't make that tackle. This drive was lost because we didn't make that block or didn't fall on the ball. Um, you know, our joke in, in, in throwing is throw far or die. You know, that's, that's, <laughs> you know, that's what's the whole thing. Well, you know, I, I just read an interesting thing about they did some research with some poor level throwers. Uh, with adding an additional turn in the discus and they got better. Well, and someone said, well, what do you think they're throwing better? Well, they went from, uh, they went from being kind of bad to marginally better. Uh, getting, getting fancier didn't make them world champion. You know, but, but yeah. And so every sport I get involved in, one of the first things I try to do is find out what are the three keys to success. And then my job is to support the, technical coach, the, the, the tactical, strategic, the head coach, on here's, here's how I can help you, how I can support these keys, these foundations. Um, and if it's an American football thing, we're going to try to have the athletes in a kind of condition that they can stay on the field and still make split-second decisions. Because a tired athlete, their decision matrix is, is not good. So, and, and we always say in football, your eyes are faster than your feet. So if you've got people doing this, you're, you're going to be okay. Um, and so that, yeah. So to me, the foundations, the, the basics, are, the fundamentals, are usually things that are pretty apparent to someone who's been around a while. Is this true in your sport, too? I would let Michael answer that, uh, given his, he's a black belt and has more experience than I do. Uh, but I, I definitely intuitively feel for sure, but I, I'll, I'll defer to him. I would definitely say it's true. There are like certain uh, movement patterns or, or movements that you have to be able to do to do jujitsu or really any grappling art. Um, like you have to be able to move your hips. You have to be able to move um, kind of your upper body, lower body, uh, both individually, but also in sync with each other. Um, because if you're not able to do that, you're not going to be as successful as somebody who can. Yeah. Um, and, of course, we do have some exceptions with kind of uh, um, Harrison had a uh, uh, partially uh, uh, what, what's it called? The uh, uh, it's kind uh, of paralysis, paralysis. Is yeah. adaptive athletics, adaptive. Uh, athlete. Yeah. So, you know, there's some adaptive athletes, but even they found ways like his coach found ways of adapting a game for him uh, based on what he was capable of doing. So uh, and, and when you find <laughs> this thing, uh, Michael. Uh, we have a kid here in Utah named Kale Sanderson. He became, un, un, yeah, okay. Kind Who's of, that? Never, heard, never of heard of him. <laughs> one time, someone asked him. He practiced the uh, ankle pick one thousand times a day. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the planet Earth knew he was going to pick your ankle, but if you only practice defending it a hundred, that extra nine hundred reps put you in a so. You know, I've had friends explain uh, American American wrestling catch can sometimes it's called, but you know, it's 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 takedown, it's takedown, reverse and pin. Uh, I think I think those were the, I, I could be wrong. Takedown, reverse pin. It was like it was like, and, and by the way, you didn't need a thousand takedowns. You didn't need a, you just needed the ability to, you know, pin. You know, and if you pin, you win. You know, uh, so I always try to look. That's it's it's. it's 
And then as a strength conditioning coach, then it's my job to make sure that we're, we're on the same flight path with you. Know, with you. Uh, if you're, uh, you're going to be a, like a, an American football uh, team like the spread, um, where the offensive linemen stand up, the whole, they, they don't go into a stance, and they always take three steps back. I'm not going to waste my time doing any bear bear crawls with those guys. I just want those. I just want five kitchen tables out there. You know, I don't. You know, I don't. I don't want to get cute. And if I do get cute, I, they might be in better shape, but they're not in shape for that offense. Mm-hmm. So that's that's when I think that's when the kind of the art side of what I do comes in. Yeah, and you you've a lot of uh, the things that I've read from you deal with. Um... Uh, the idea of assessing what are the the needs of the athlete, you know, both structurally and and you know what they what what their sort of physical we, we might say problems are, but then also uh, reinforcing what uh, what things they need for their sport. Um, and uh, the cliche is train your weaknesses, compete with your strengths. You know, you're constantly trying to make you're trying to bring that issue whatever the issues are up, but once it's game time, <laughs> that, that all goes out the window. You got, you, you do, you have to win. Uh, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but here in the States, uh, it's, it's, it's win or die. I mean, it's, I mean, I'd like to say it's, it's also wonderful for the child to be exposed to all these things and except there's not a fan, there's not a parent or fan in the stands. They'll say that at the kitchen table, but they don't mean it at the game. Yeah. Uh, if Harrison's getting gu- guillotined uh, and you never taught, taught him a counter, well, good for you, Michael, but he's out there getting strangled out. <laughs> I he, prob- he doesn't defend, so. <laughs> he, he probably taught it to me, but I just suck at learning. So, <laughs> you know, it's uh, when we when we talk about that, it's um, uh for for jujitsu, we you know like Michael being a, a strength and conditioning minded person within the jujitsu community, I'm going to say this and, it, and it's going to sound really foreign to you, but being strong as a jujitsu practitioner is almost considered an insult uh, because people want you to think of them as technical, which means efficient and not using strength. And uh, so Mike has done a good job because I've worked with him of uh, assessing my needs within both, you know, my, uh, my jujitsu journey, but also, you know, the strength conditioning side of it. And uh, so we wanted to talk to you about some of your tools for assessment because your models for assessment are, are what our assessment tools are based off of. So we kind of wanted to get from straight from the, the source. So I have a formal assessment I do with people I call everybody else, non athletes Okay. The bulk of the population, and it's, it's called the one, two, three, four. But really, the assessment I use on a course now—they've been quiet for a couple of hours. My street's getting redone, so. Um, and whenever I do a podcast, I decide to bring out the you know the uh, <laughs> the pounder machine. Um, but really, the assessment I use in the sports side is "Can you go?" And it's that simple. And there's two phrases: there's "Can you go," which is what we say before performance. And then now what is what we say after performance. And really, the, the, the biggest assessments we have, now I'm as a strength coach, I, I see my relationship with a technical coach. So if I'm working with Michael, I put us into a, a basically a yin-yang relationship. Uh, what usually happens uh, when I was first coaching, everybody had, uh, let's just say the technical side is the white and the strength is the black. Let's just say that. They would come in with what we call a flat tire. Rather weak, but they knew every move in the, in the book. They, they had excellent technique. In 2020, what I'm discovering is people are coming in, especially the track and field, with terrible techniques, and yet these high school kids can bench 400 and squat five. And then they get in the ring and they do a terrible standing throw. So my job, and this is the way I see our, our, us working together, Michael, is that you and I, are going to work with this person and I'm going to get their strength conditioning levels to improve as you improve their technical side and their strategic side and their tactical side. And what we'd like to do is have those two work together, expanding that circle out together. 
And what you'll find, and it's very natural, is that if, if you have a vision of that, of working, okay, you know, if you have a kid the first day and you just beat the living hell out of them, because uh, they're, they're, they're not going to learn a single thing. So you have to be kind of wise in the beginning process of walking with the athletes where you get them. And, of course, when they look over at the other man or the other ring and you see the elites, they can see that not only do I need to learn a lot more tactically and technically, but I need to learn, I need to have a bigger work, I need more work capacity, I need more explosion, I need more grip strength, I need more, and you know, fill in the blank. Now what is the discussion after every competition? Now, it could be Harrison, I say, well, you know, now what? And you say, I never, ever want to do that ever, 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 ever again. Okay, well, let's, <laughs> good, thank you. But now what is generally we look it over and we look for three different, we're, what I'm trying to do is get the athlete to, to come in into three different places. Let's go with the easiest one first. Where was my heart rate? Now, uh, as a discus thrower, I want my heart rate in the 90s when I compete. Now, if I'm freaking out, my heart rate is 140 and I'm not going to have the processes to appropriately compete. If I'm at 70, I'm not ready to go either. I don't have the, I never throw the discus at 70 hard. You know, maybe the first one or two warm-ups, but it gets up there quickly. Now, Harrison is out there. Harrison, how old are you? I'm uh, 40. Okay, Harris is on the mat. and he's His whole fight, he's at 175. Well, he's a candle getting burned on both ends with a blowtorch in the middle. So the easiest thing for us to do is to get the person to train and compete in the in a heart rate area that's appropriate for competition. And then the other two things are what I call tension. Tension is physical tension. Tension is uh, uh, when you deadlift, you're at a nine on tension. Mm -hmm. A ten would be sticking your finger in an outlet and getting zapped. Okay? <laughs> One would be smoking dope and uh, in a hot tub. You know, okay. I don't know, Michael, where would a good tension level be for a fighter in a tournament on the mat? So that's going to depend on the position that they're in. And Very like American football. It's going yeah. to depend by situation to situation. And it's and it can be up, down, up, down, up, down. Um, and it's usually the people who can regulate that the best um, that typically do the best, you know. People who can kind of stay calm when they need to be calm and be... Uh, basically tense when they're when they need to be tense when I work with fighters well it depends but one, one <laughs> thing we do with some fighters is we teach them that thing called easy strength where basically it's a heavy press a heavy pull up a heavy deadlift and farmer walks there's your whole weightlifting program all high 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 tension now but as we get closer to competition I want them to do maybe a, a deadlift followed by battling ropes followed by Monkey ball. Uh, that's that would be a weird but interesting combination. Uh, for American football, deadlift followed by bear crawl is great for American football. It, it's actually a very good thing. It, it, the offensive lineman says that's what it's like. Feels like on a veer team. So what we try to do so that the athlete in the weight room is practicing, and I'm teaching them turning that tension level up and down. And then the third, of course, is heart rate physical tension, and then arousal. And arousal is the mental side of tension. Where do you want your arousal level to be? Well, in the discus, you want it to be about a four on a scale of 10. You want to have some very quiet, you want to be calm, you want to be able to smile. Shot putters can have much more arousal, okay? You don't want a place kicker in American football on a field goal to have very high arousal. That's why the best thing you do with the kicker is never talk to them. It just whatever, whatever at they're at. Don't don't try to tell them it's the most important kick in history, because as the arousal goes up, their chances of missing goes up too. So the next job you have to do, Michael, is figure out where you want that arousal level to be. And guess what? Once again, in fighting, it's going to swim up and down. That's why I think it's such nonsense in the pre-fight stuff where they do all that in each other's face stuff. I think it's nonsense because. You don't want to bring into the ring a ton of arousal because 
I don't, what are your, how, how long are your rounds? Um, it, it kind of varies based on the uh, competition. Some, the very kind of low end or beginner type stuff is usually about three minute rounds. Then you kind of go up to five and then usually 10 or sometimes 20 minute rounds. Okay. In a 20 minute round, do you, do you want to step on the mat and be dancing and screaming and pounding your chest, screaming at the audience? No, because <laughs> after you shake that guy's hand, you're going to go, and so what our job is after after Harrison fought is to kind of get a sense of where would were you getting gas to go, yeah, it was weird, and then see if there was a tension issue or an arousal issue that we can practice not only on the mat, but in the strength and conditioning side. If he needs more tension control, well, we might want to mix um deadlifts with monkey bars because you can't have a ton of tension on monkey bars or, or you know something that's something that uh, has to move a little bit differently so he has to learn to quickly if he's pulling a big deadlift dropping the bar and leaping up to monkey bars he has to quickly change gears and that's that's so that's that to me that's how i assess athletes can you go are you ready uh i always have checklists because i find checklists are the best thing an athlete can have. Because if I have a checklist that says shoes, oh hell, I forgot. You know, uh, <laughs> towel, water, you know, whatever it is. Uh, did I pay the fee? Did I have, do I have the card? Do I have my driver's license? Because they want, you know, you go down through these, you know, the checklist. Very often, a checklist is probably the best thing you can do to get an athlete's arousal and tension level at the right spot. Because that piece of paper, and I laminate them, by the way. You laminate them so they stay. And that piece of paper does this for most athletes. It turns the engines down so that now they can focus on what needs to be done. And then after, win, lose, or draw, I always like to go through the now what scenario. All right. Um, and then it's, it's interesting, Michael, and I'm sure Harrison, with your experience, you'd agree. After a competition is over, the clarity you have about your training is optimal. Mm -hmm. So what, the reason I rush it into the ideas of heart rate, tension, and arousal, cardiovascular system, muscular and nervous system, mental systems, is that if I said, okay, how is your mind? Most athletes would say, well, you know, I had a banana on the way over. I usually don't eat banana. Okay, that's not what I meant. But arousal is something a little bit, I'm not asking about your brain when I talk about arousal, so people stay cool with that, if that makes sense. When I talk about tension, some athletes will say, it was weird, I was so nervous before. I shook the guy's hand, we did the, you know, we did the national anthem, and I could feel during the national anthem, I just felt like the sand was going out of my ass. You know, if you've ever had that feeling before competition where it's like, oh my God, I left it all in the warm-up room, or I left it all in the training hall. Or I left it all on the beach in Jamaica seven months ago. It, you know, and my job at the neck. So we have a competition. We go through those simple questions, and then we prepare. We we tr we change subtly our strength conditioning, and subtly our our platform or field practice to adapt with what the athlete is feeling. And you keep trying to uh, like a sailboat. You keep trying to hone that in to you get to you get it right. And when an athlete gets it, gets it right, uh, that's when you get those bizarre superlative performances. The nice thing about track and field, uh, especially in throwing, is sometimes some uh, the young lady just broke the American record in the discus last week. She added five meters to her throw on her first throw. Well, that is one of those. I mean, we've all had that day. I added one time 33 pounds on my clean and jerk in one training session. And I was, young, I was younger, but still. Everybody has those moments where all of a sudden everything connects and they have that bizarre, outstanding performance. And that's why I do that. So it's can you go and now what? And it's weird because those are simple sentences. They're simple. But if you take the time to develop them out, you can actually ping together a really good training model based on the. And by the way, even the successes, Harrison wins just destroys everybody out there. But you want to talk to him about how he missed the guillotine hold, but he wants to talk about some other odd thing. 
And you still have to be able to listen to that. Because sometimes in, uh, this, this is not only the truth of me, I never lose anything from success. I never learn anything from success. Zero, nothing. I only learn from failure, losing. Losing propels me much clearer than winning. When I win, you know, I, I don't know. I don't learn anything when I win. <laughs> <laughs> but losing, I, I learn everything. So uh, you have to, you, you do ch- strive to balance those two, those two sides in the assessment. Was that okay? Was that clear? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and what you said about, uh, I, I personally can relate greatly to the idea that you don't learn a lot from winning. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this actually reminds me of one of the articles that, that I had read from you where uh, you had talked about an assessment of uh, what was the worst thing that had happened to you as a track athlete and then uh, how, how that related to like the best thing that happened to you. Yeah, that and, piece of paper was somewhere up in this desk here. Shoot, I would have, I would have found it. Uh, sorry. Yeah. It, so, so, yeah, so they had us do the best and worst list of our athletic career. And almost all of us discovered that our worst led to our best. Our second worst led to our second best. Because that is a great engine of public failure is a wonderful engine for clarity. Yeah, I, uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and, and in my experience, and this is just for me, it doesn't even have to be public. But the times when I've really blown it and just knew that I blew it, those are the times when I, I got, you know, the most grind in me. And uh, when, when I, I'm almost a little bit like a cockroach, you know, it's like I don't do well when things are going well. I get lazy and I get fat and, you know, I'm just kind of, kind of a loaf. But when the chips are down and when it's an emergency, when everything sucks, that's when I turn on. And uh, so – in order to not be like one of those dramatic people who's always seeking, you know, like problems, uh, you know, I've tried to level that out and try to be motivated when I was, you know, somewhat successful. But it is it is a challenge to me as a person. My natural inclination is when things are going good, I coast. And uh, uh, that's that's some, that's a personality flaw. But I, because well, you know, if you talk to marriage therapists, they say the same same thing about their clients. Uh, we had a great marriage, 15, 20 years, not a single problem. And what did you do for it? Nothing. But once she says, I'm leaving, all of a sudden, that's when the flowers show up again. That's when the, the, the romantic dinner shows up. Yeah, we, we, it's, it's a very, Harrison, you're not unusual. Uh, most, <laughs> of us tend to, uh, most of us tend to coast as much as we can. Um, yeah. It's uh, one of the, one of the, um, the things within jujitsu is because it is a constant barrage for most of us of small failures. Uh, I have found that it is very motivating and, and actually somewhat satisfies that need I have for, for uh, like mild trauma in a way. It's like every day you get your butt kicked a little bit and it's like, oh man, I got hit with 15 guillotines today. So tomorrow I'm going to try and get hit with 14 and that's going to be my victory, you know, and, and it's very challenging uh, from an emotional level as a, an adult male to, uh, to, to get, you know, just worked on the mat uh, yeah. and to survive that. But if you can, there's a whole lot of um, just like what we were saying, like there's a whole lot of good that can come from that, that those problems, because as you start to solve them, you start to become like a pretty vicious force on the mat and uh, the person who's given other people problems. It's interesting you say that because, you know, there's the long distance runners love that feeling of that lactose burn when they go up a hill. Our bodybuilder brothers and sisters, they love to go for that burn. You know, the burn in both of those sports is actually, uh, (laughs) it's when your body's failing on you. (laughs) And yet, they seek it. And it's interesting you say about the same about jujitsu is that in a sense, you should be seeking those. You should keep finding better practice partners. Right. Yeah. And, and even, e- sorry, I was going to say just even within the practice partners that you have, if you're clubbing them all like a baby seal, then you got to start handicapping. You got to find ways to put yourself in positions where 
they're more even with you. So let's we have a position called the mount. That's when one person is you know, yeah. basically sitting on the other. You may you may be if no one ever got you in the mount, you would never have any problems. But if you find yourself in the mount, then it's it's a struggle to get back out. So as the person who maybe is the best person on the mat, your job is not to just go around, you know, beating everybody. It's to find ways to get people to, to be in the mount on you so that you can work your way out of that uh, and improve with people who aren't as good as you. That is the beauty of track and field and swimming is that there's this number. And even if you don't, you're not on the same continent, you can still, you can still put that towel out at the world record, the American record, the Canadian record and go, yeah, I think I'm good, but I ain't good. Yeah. And so, yeah. But in your world, you guys have to do that kind of thing because it is, you know, it is human on human. Yeah. I like that. That's, that's, a, that's, Right, make sure you write that down. That's good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so to to kind of move on, you know, you have uh, you've performed and coached and and been athletic over a, over decades, and that's one of the biggest goals of this show is to really um, increase the longevity of our of ourselves and the athletes that we work with, and to give an example. The initial vision of this show was to roll dangerously into my 65th birthday. And then through the show, we met and interviewed a guy named Tom Corey, who started at 65 and is a vicious brown belt at 72. And so my standards of performance and longevity have been upped just you know, yeah. because we have this show. And so we wanted to ask you, you know, some of the things that you've seen as both an athlete and a coach in terms of longevity – Maybe bumps in the road, things to avoid, or things sure. like you know to do this, don't do that. And I'm not trying to, you know, simplify it. I just get your thoughts no. on it because I got you covered. Uh, first off, I always break it down into four different words, just for clarity. The first is health, and that's the optimal interplay of the of the human organs. Okay, if you have cancer but you want to do just you, now, uh, you're not healthy. You're, you're a good fighter, but you're not healthy. And that's blood tests, that's seeing the dentist, that's the eye doctor, that's results, okay? Uh, that's being cleared of this or that problem. The next one is the biggest problem we have in our field, and it's the word fitness. And that's simply the ability to do a task. And we get real, and I think CrossFit did us all a real disservice by changing the rules of what fitness is. You know, uh, the, the generalists are fine, I get that. I have great respect for generalists. A friend of mine, Pat Flynn, has a book right there on being a generalist. There's nothing wrong with it. But for those of us in elite performance, uh, it's, it's not going to help you. And then the third one is longevity. And I put two things in longevity. One is quantity, and the other one is quality. And that's going to be an issue we all have to kind of face. You can live a long, miserable life and be in terrible shape and live to 110. Or, you know, you can, you can be a boon to society uh, you know, have a bunch of people named after you, uh, <laughs> be immortalized, and 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 die sooner. And I think what we're looking for when we talk about longevity is a nice blend of the two. And of course, the fourth one is performance, and that's when someone calls your name and you do so. So when you fight, that's performance. When I throw, that's performance. If we said we want to climb Mount Olympus. That's fitness. No one's going to show up there that morning. Hello, welcome. Now, climb that. You just so fitness and performance sometimes get clouded into each other. So to help you guys, the first thing I would try to get you to do is step back and see that you know what can you do for your health. Well, floss your teeth, go see doctors, do your annual visits. Uh, if, uh, you, if, you, if you know, do your breast check, do your skin check for your cancers. Um, well, you know, it's the, they're, they're all very simple and all kind of funny to say out loud because they're so obvious. Get a good night's sleep, eat your vegetables, drink water. I mean, really, what did I just say? It comes in an area like fitness that's ignored because you're going to perform. So when it comes to longevity, I would suggest that first, just get the fundamental simple stuff and take care of it. Wear your seatbelt, 
wear a helmet when appropriate, uh, wash your teeth, uh, basics of hygiene, you know, and take care of that stuff, And but take care of it. When it comes in, uh, on longevity as an athlete, now that's a little bit more involved, but still I'm going to say the same thing to you. It's going to be, you're going to have to, at your 40, right? So at your age, you're starting to get to that area where you actually need to work like a bodybuilder. You're going to start needing hypertrophy work because after a certain age, and I'm convinced it's about 35, the body conspires to get as fat and soft as it possibly can. You know, I wouldn't, I'm not guilty of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I get these, uh, I'll look at these, uh, they're called influence, fitness influencers. And you've got this 22 year old girl uh, naked on a beach, you know, with this great body. Well, of course you have a great body. You're, you're 22 years old. And, you know, you've, you've been blessed with some good DNA. Uh, do that same thing at 52. And, and I, that's what I want to talk to the 52 year old. Uh, naked female model. Actually, I do actually want to talk to her, but that's a <laughs> time. But uh, I mean, if you can hold it together, you know, physically after 35, that's much different. So what I would recommend for you is when you look at training in the weight room, your push, your pull, and your squat work have to be more in a hypertrophy bodybuilding style. Um, the, the exercise selection you have should also be there to promote flexibility and mobility. So you doing half back squats has no value anymore for Harrison. I want you to do full goblet squats or even overhead squats or, or front squats because that front squat is going to challenge your wrist, elbow, and shoulder flexibility. That's also going to make you stand more upright, which is going to change the way the hips move. So once you hit a certain age, your push, pull, and squat, sorry about that, this is just construction. No, this is awesome. <laughs> Your push, pull, and squat work, probably about 25 reps of workout. That's three sets of eight, five sets of five. The exact same, it's the push, the pull, and the squat, exact same numbers. So if you're doing three sets of eight in the, oh, a military press, three sets of eight in the lap, pull down, or pull up, three sets of eight. When it comes to hinge work, you have to make a decision. Do I need to get stronger in the hinge, or can I use that for conditioning? For conditioning, you kind of all swings. Or like just deadlifts, trap bar deadlifts are fun. And you might as well, since you're doing three sets of eight, just do three sets of eight there. And then just do loaded carries. And for you guys, I'd recommend more like bear hug carries, okay? Uh, bear hug carries and some former uh, bars for the grip. So this is for the internal, I call it anaconda strength, in, mm -hmm. internal pressure. And the former walk is for posture and improved grip. And there you go. <laughs> There's your weight workout. Now you're gonna say you're gonna say Harrison, well, where's my conditioning? Well, when you hit 40, your conditioning has to be a little bit more specific. So your conditioning is gonna to have to come on the mat. So um, yeah, we can certainly, with Michael's help, we probably could, you know, six weeks, 12 weeks out from a competition, we could turn some of that weight room stuff into some more, if appropriate. If we talked about this after um, a competition, you need to work on your arousal levels we could do something like that but really the bulk of it's going to your condition has to be on the mat and then occasional walks um so for me what's going to happen after there's no i would say 36 and above no question no question at 55 at 55 if you become a mobile bodybuilder uh you you, you really uh i'm 63 and one of the things that um amazes me at my age is that three sets of eight the least sexy workout in the history of least sexy workouts <laughs> minute rest does more good for me overall than than blasting away at this and that and this and it's been remarkable as I've, I've finally put my arms around this idea that once you hit a certain age you begin to stiffen up in the joints uh, okay Mobility is the free movement around the joints. Flexibility is a system of tricking your nervous system into letting go. And I think mobility is more important after a certain age than like flexibility. I mean, yeah, that's enough. And then hypertrophy bodybuilding work 
has to has to move into the forefront after about I would say right now you, that's where you should be thinking. So when you're doing work in the weight room, you want to do deeper squats. You want to put the bar overhead or that squat. You want a front squat to challenge your mobility flexibility because that is going to pay. So that's going to pay dividends every every day. You complain about your wrists and elbows and shoulders because you're stretching them so hard. Is going to pay dividends five years ago when you have that you haven't lost any mobility and any lean body mass. Right now, I guarantee your lean body mass issues are are you're you're literally your body's trying to get fatter and softer. Mm-hmm. It just is. Now, some guys I know trick it by taking this testosterone replacement therapy, and that's I'm, I'm not going to judge it, but really you can get most of the benefits of that stuff just by having an intelligent approach to training. So uh, we, now that we're in longevity, uh, so for you and anybody, you, I'm not saying you have to train like a body, but I'm just saying three sets of eight in a push, a pull, and a squat, and a trap bar deadlift, and far more. Ones. It doesn't have to be insane, but it has to be that 156 workouts a year, three days a week, keep coming back in. You want, I mean, certainly three sets of eight is going to get the, then you move to three sets of five, then you go to five sets of five, then you go to five sets of three, and then you start again at three sets of eight with new exercise or something like that. You want to play around with that 15 to 30 total reps in the workout number. You want to increase your lean body mass as well as you can. Um, but your workouts have to be sort of snappy to the point and get out. You want to you want to find movements. That's why I'm a big fan of, okay, so this is the pull-up. This is the chin up, and then there's neutral grip. I, I like all every variation of pull up you can do because it's going to challenge not only your shoulders, elbows, and wrists, but it's going to challenge almost down to your belly button in mobility and flexibility. If you've ever done a pull up, uh, very often you'll get these weird little, like you'll jump down and you'll kind of go like this because you've got a weird cramp at some place. And, you know, well, I, didn't, I thought this was supposed to work. You know, you'll get this weird cramp. Because your body's trying to stabilize everything. Um, when it comes to performance, uh, your your focus on hypertrophy, mobility, and general condition is going to take you a lot farther than some magical, you know, adding the snatch and the clean and jerk. You should have snatched and clean and jerk in your teens and twenties. And I, you certainly can add them. I would not. Yeah, I think uh, as far as power movements, for me specifically, I, I do a lot of kettlebell swings just because I find them fun and I'm pretty good at them. Uh, but as far as like getting heavier than that, you know, snatches or clean and jerks, I, I don't really, I don't take a lot of pleasure in those. So I, I don't necessarily program them. Uh, and also my my hip hinge is, is honestly my, my strongest movement. Uh, you know, just if you assess me, uh, that's, that's where I have the most skill. So at, adding to it at this point for me is not, you know, really that beneficial. Whereas for some others that might, you know, the snatch and clean jerk might be really, really beneficial because they need that. If they were younger. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying at 40, I'm just saying. Yeah, we're, into, we're focused on the question of, you know, you roll on until you're 85 and you'll be able to do that. If you, the other thing too about hypertrophy work. Now I, I think you should snatch clean jerk power in your youth. Because you want to keep your strength levels. This is a this is research from the 40s and 50s. There's nothing new. But if you're a, a trained person and an untrained person, both lose strength at the same rate as we age. Mm. But the trained person is up here. So I'm 63. I'm stronger than, well, I hate the word, but there's few people I know who are stronger. But even though I'm dropping, my my strength, relative strength is dropping, I'm still far above an untrained 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old. And you know, what we want to do is delay that as long as we can, this abyss down here. And so any gains you made in strength in your youth, you are now living uh, nicely on that. Pat Flynn has a, has a great quote, and I want you to, I want you to put this into your heart, Harrison. The plateau is the new PR. 
the plateau is the new personal record. So that's something I've been doing. You know, I'm 23 years older than you guys. I mean, that's that's a lot of water under that damn bridge. And my recommendation for you is any injury you get in the next 23 years because you're being stupid. I mean, I don't mind <laughs> if you get hurt. I don't mind if you get hurt. Competing. I'm, I'm, that's that's just part of what dancing the dancing the razor blade I, on, on a razor blade. I got that. Um, but you do something stupid in the weight room, you know, someone decides to have a kipping pull-up contest with you, and you pop your shoulder or elbow out, that doesn't get better. Those, those injuries don't get better. So one of the things you want to start doing is get as strong, get, get as much load as you can in such reasonable numbers so that not only does your lean body mass go up, but your strength levels stay high cheaply. That's a, that instead of easy strength, I should have broke the book cheap strength. I like that phrase. Cheap strength. You just, you want to stay as strong as you can with the <clears throat> mm-hmm. By the way, that is the secret to strength and vision. Uh, you get there, the most is, the, the first is with the most is. You know, you just want to be, you don't, you don't get extra points for working hard in my world. No one, uh, at the beginning of the football game, the official says uh, to both captains, how many hours you train this week? 22. How many hours you guys to train? Train? 10. Okay, you get an additional five points because you train more. That's not the way it goes. <laughs> so that's the, the, so where you're at right now, this idea of rolling until you're 95, 100, is, the big thing is, is to keep yourself relatively injury-free, soreness not necessarily, not soreness-free, but injury-free, and hang in there as long as you can in that plateau, doing the most basic, simple things you can. And if you got to mix things up with reps and sets, that's fine. Or even movements, you go from military to incline, military for six months, incline for six months, bench press for six months, decline for six months. Perfect, no problem at all. Goblet squat for three months, overhead squat, front squat, back squat, great. But the idea is that you keep coming in, you keep coming in. And by the way, changing that small, same but different idea with movement selection, Aubrey does pop up the hypertrophy and mobility work for a short amount of time. It's like, it's like free, it's like free, uh, free games. Does that kind of go back to the idea of like everything works for four weeks. So if you make a small change, you get a four week bounce. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, you know, er, you know, that's, that's the standard joke. We, we always say everything works. You know, call me up on day 43. You know, because that's when everything fails. And so that's why, and I don't want to sell my own site, but I'm going to, so here you go. But at danjohnuniversity.com, we've got that workout generator, which would be perfect for you because you would just plug it in and it would, it will logically assign, uh, I got a guy emailing, he's one of the people, one of the early users, and he goes, well, I'm back to three sets of 12, but I'm so much stronger than I used to be at three sets of eight. And and it, as he says, he's making he's making some real good progress again. It's kind of fun to watch it, and that's pretty simple stuff. And we'll we'll uh, put a link to that in the uh, the description for YouTube, and then also the show notes on the uh, the audio only. Yeah, and just if they put the name, if they when they sign up, if they add the word Corona as a code, it's twenty nine dollars for three months. So, okay, yeah. So which is, I mean, I have. I'd give it away for free, but I have to pay people to do that. And the website, uh, uh, so I, I, but I pay, I have to be able to be able to pay people. That's why I would yeah, give it away for free. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, well, we, uh, uh, we're big fans of yours. So we'll be glad to show your, uh, your stuff to anybody that's willing to, to do it. Uh, uh, one of the questions I, I, I kind of wanted to have, um, and you kind of mentioned in there, uh, soreness, so it kind of leads me into um, recovery um, and recovery modalities um, or just recovery methods in general. Because um, something that uh, my strength coach, who I, I got a ton from, uh, is also a big advocate of yours as well. Um, he always told me, he's like, you can only train what you can recover from. That's absolutely true. And, and so I was kind of curious as to um, what sort of recovery things do you sort of advocate or have you seen really work well, especially as, like you said, you got 23 years on Harrison and you got a couple more years than that on me. So 
you know, I'm, I'm always very fascinated in what's going to keep me getting back in there um, day to day. Michael, let me go big picture and then the, and I'll give you some, then I'll undo what I just said and go into some things I think actually do work. There's two things. Number one is sleep. Sleep is the best recovery tool. I'm going to come right back to that in a minute. And the other one is what my wife and daughters call FOMO. F-O-M-O. Fear of missing out. I think the biggest problem we have in recovery right now is you read that Tom Brady sleeps in magic underwear. The reason I'm not a six-time, 12-time Super Bowl quarterback is because I didn't have the right underwear. And then you read that this other guy has a, there's these new peanut-shaped uh, foam rollers that also have massagers in there. Well, you know, that's why I'm not the Olympic champion is my foam roller wasn't a peanut-shaped one. You know, okay, you, you, you follow, you follow me going here? Um, I, I'm only taking, oh, I got the wrong herbs. I'm only using cinnamon and ginger. I should have been using agawasha and yang yang. Water. Having said that, so I'm going to tell you sleep is first, but I'm going to show you something. I don't, I don't get a nickel for this, and it's weird that I had it on my table. Oh, because I have to power that. But this thing here, it's, uh, it's a headband with Bluetooth speakers in here. So when you put it on, it covers your eyes. And I, I got to tell you, it, you need to sleep. I think it's not a bad idea to nap. I'm a big fan of napping for athletes. But if you put this on, and there's a, there's a station on the Internet called Brain.fm. And you can put it on for guided sleep, guided meditation, or it's got that white noise with the ocean sounds and all that. Or they can guide you into it. And one of the reasons I recommend something like this, uh, by the way, the problem with normal earphones is when you fall asleep, uh, the earphone starts to dig into your head. These, these don't. Again, I make no money for this. This is just a suggestion. Uh, there's a free app I do every day called One Moment Med Meditation. It's a one-minute meditation. And I always say to myself, if I can't find a minute a day to do that, then it don't matter. I've worked way too hard. So, Let's go. Let's go with the two. Let's, let's break it down. Sleep and FOMO first. The biggest question is, how was your quality of sleep? Did you get your nine hours? In? Did you get, keep pushing that up with your athletes, by the way. Did you get your 10 hours? In? No, coach, you only got nine. You keep wanting, you want to raise the bar and sleep. You want them to go to bed early and sleep long, okay? And then FOMO is the other side. Things. And I remember when Wim Hof came out, a couple of my friends bought horse troughs. Uh, you guys down there in Kentucky know what a horse trough is. Mm -hmm. And they'd go to the store and they'd buy bags of ice, pour it in there, fill it with water, and then jump in this bath for about eight seconds and go, no way, I'm never. So now they got a massive horse trough in the backyard and wasted about 200 bucks on ice. The interesting thing about ice therapy and saunas is that the research says that they, you get the exact same results from both. Now, so the reason I say that, the body likes extremes. So I'm a big fan of what's called the James Bond shower. Uh, you get in the shower, you shampoo, you shave, and then you finish it off with ice cold water. It's, called, it's, it's from, uh, must be Dr. No, because uh, he's because in Casino Royale and got a job. It's in the books. But I think the body likes extremes. So if your athletes are spending a lot of time in a hot, sweaty pit, sauna might not help them, but maybe an, a, a James Bond shower might. Now, you're not going to become the world BJJ champion because you took a shower this afternoon, right? It wasn't because of that shower. But if it does anything, even up here, to trend you in the right direction, I'm okay with. So in the areas of recovery, guided meditations, uh, nap time, uh, getting yourself to learn to fall asleep anywhere at any time, uh, that's, a, that's something I learned to do way too late in my career. Uh, there, are, there are ways to teach yourself to fall asleep. Very, uh, Bud Winter's book, Relaxing the Womb, which of course should be right there, but I don't know where it is. Uh, he, he trained himself to fall asleep anytime, anywhere. To me, that's one of the more important things you could be teaching your athletes or uh, getting your athletes to learn to do 
is fall asleep as quickly. Make it competitive sleeping. See how fast you can fall asleep uh, because it's going to be sleep. It's going to be sleep. And then everything else is FOMO with some value. I mean, there's obviously value. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've ever had a pedicure, but we have them here in Utah where they go in and they cut your nail, your toenails, and then they do a 15-minute foot and calf massage. I think that's the best calf, it's the best massage I've ever had in my life, and they only focus on feet and calves. I'll tell you one thing, while I'm there, I fall asleep because they knock me out massaging my calves because I carry a lot of angst in my feet. So you might be able to find it very inexpensive. Like I know people listening want me to say things like Swedish massage and stuff, but I don't know if you ever had a massage, but if the masseuse is not good, it's not, it's a waste of an hour and a half. Uh, and so what the problem with, with most uh, recovery modalities is you're always falling into the application and the practitioner. You can put on, you can go, but I have the magic uh, sleeping clothes and I like it when I travel, but it, I didn't add 12 feet to my discus because of it. Okay. It does help me sleep on the road. I will say that. Though. And it keeps disgusting creatures off of you in hotel rooms. And they're disgusting. <laughs> Was that yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm usually a disgusting creature in the hotel. Uh, I'm an airline pilot, so I'm always there just oh, being okay. disgusting. <laughs> well, who do you fly for? Uh, I fly for uh, 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 Republic Airways. We're a uh, subsidiary carrier for uh, Delta, United, and American. Yeah, I'm a, my wife and I are both diamonds for Delta, yeah. Okay, yeah, I've I've uh, flown in and out of uh, Salt Lake a few times, so you might have, you might have been on my bird, and uh, if so, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, I've always had nothing but good landings. That's all. That's all I care about. You know, uh, that's awesome. Okay, I hope that answered it, Michael. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Sorry if you had another question. Oh no, I was just. Um, <clears throat> I I think it's very fascinating that you kind of boiled it down to basically something that's that simple, but also just that important in the long run is just sleep <laughs> well and then you're going to ask me about nutrition and i'm going to say you i'm going to tell you the protein and vegetables and then i'm going to tell you to drink water um uh, here's the reason if now if i sold these beverages and protein powders then i have a completely different answer i'd be telling you guys how important the dan john product line is but uh once you've been around long enough you realize that you can't buy your way those those i hate those uh sports beverage drink commercials on TV, you know. In fact, I, I make probably too much fun about them in my new book. But, uh, you know, these kids, are they high-five each other, they drink the drink, and they, they're sweating, and all of a sudden they're state champions. It's all a bunch of nonsense. You're not going to defeat me because of the sport drink you drink. You're not going to. Uh, no offense. I mean, nice as I can say it. It, it yeah. um, it's 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 not the sports drink. It's not the magic formula. It's it's getting it in, getting it done. You know, it's time on the mat. It's working with better people. It's getting yourself in the complex situations and figuring out a way to get out of it while you're exhausted. You know, it's dealing with your exhaustion uh, and overcoming it by slowing your heart rate or dealing with your tension levels. That's what elite performance is. It's, you, you can't buy it in the game. Unless it says Dan John on the cover, then buy it. Then, then, yeah, yeah I, w I would add uh, Harrison Heltebrand or any other alias I may be using, uh, <laughs> just depending upon you know what state I'm selling stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I wish I wish. You know, I, I had a nice talk with Tom Plummer one time, and he said that he's the guy who said that I'm an overnight success. It just took me forty years to get there. Mm -hmm. um, but Tom, one time, we had a nice talk, and he said, you know, I, I can never sell out. And he says, so much of my branding is not being a sellout. It's, it's talking about sleep, seat belts, dental floss, you know, that kind of thing. All the stuff that works that we can't make a nickel on. I mean, how much money am I going to make telling your listeners to sleep and drink water? No. But I think those are your two best recovery tools. Uh, when we uh, interviewed uh, Dr. James Escaloni, uh, who's a physical therapist and jiu-jitsu practitioner, uh, one of the one of the big things that he talked about for longevity, as far as like uh, joint health, uh, was the same thing. Uh, 
he said, uh, eating a pound of vegetables a day, uh, will help you to control your blood sugar and, uh, controlled blood sugar will, uh, slow the, uh, thickening and loss of suppleness of our uh, tendons and ligaments over time. And I was like, is there a mechanism of that? And he goes, yeah, if you eat a pound of vegetables, it's just real damn hard to eat a other bunch of shit. You know, it's like, (laughs) (laughs) well, the research on gut biomes that's come out, especially in the last year and a half, you know, by having a healthy gut biome, a, 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 a ter- the enteric system, having a having a wide variety of of biome of the gut biome is very helpful. Strange thing is, once I started, I, I did some simple things. I'm now doing what I call a gut biome break twice a day. That's why I eat a forkful of sauerkraut and eat an appropriate amount of fruit, usually very small. But what I'm trying to do is send in, send my gut something to work with that makes them multiply. If all you eat is beige food, that's chicken nuggets, that's macaroni and cheese, that's hot dog buns and stuff, it's very simple for your body to, to process all that. And what's going to win is the laziest of the gut body. And the reason I mention this is that there's some research now, and I don't know, I got to be careful when I read these things, because, but there's an argument that certain kinds of Alzheimer's, uh, uh, dementias, uh, Parkinson's, and a few other nervous system diseases are strongly impacted by the gut biome. And so it's it's interesting because one, if, I'm, if you're going to ask me about supplements, my number one supplement would be to eat kimchi or fermented food or sauerkraut or something like that and it's it's not very sexy but it, it works it so we works gotta really. we gotta start the uh dan john harrison healthy brand line of kimchi then <laughs> i had one of my uh readers send me in a can of kimchi sauerkraut and i gotta tell you man that's pretty good that was pretty good <laughs> well I think uh, we've kind of covered most of the elements that that were important to me, uh, Michael. If, if you feel the same way, then I would leave it to Dan to say, um, if if you were assessing an athlete, or, or you know, if you were just looking at an athlete, you know, almost sight unseen, were there any questions that we missed that we just didn't know to ask that you would feel important uh, both for ourselves to to you know improve our own journey? But also, you know, those that were they're sharing sharing with this. Well, it's something I've said before, but you guys in in, in 2020 we might be able to do it better. Uh, I used to say I would watch my athletes the first 10 minutes very carefully when they came in, because I, I'm a big believer that the first 10 minutes are indicative. Yes, it's a gear change if you have a high school kid going from algebra class to the weight. I, I get that. God bless you. That can be a gear change. But one thing you might want to do is film the first, if if it's appropriate, um, film when people come in. Just film when people come in. And start to get a sense in that first 10 minutes or so how much of it's internal and how much is it you two telling them to stand up, roll. You know, once someone's been doing a sport for five or six years, do they really need to be told to warm up or roll or throw the table? <laughs> and that's that's something. So for me, I've always been a big fan of the first 10 minutes. Um, that's why when you coach like high school football, that's why the school I coached that we didn't have a facility to practice at the time at the school. So I used to have to take the sophomores and freshmen in a bus to practice. And what I discovered was that that 10-minute drive out and back every day, not very long, right, 10 minutes, I turned that into the most important thing. That's when we did all the announcements. That's when I went over all the changes. So when we rolled out of that bus, we were all, and I would say, okay, I want you at the, the you know, it was second base. I wish, I wish I had a better thing to say than second base, but because it was a softball field also. Okay. Get in your line, second base. We're, we're going to go right into passing drills when we get off the bus. You know, offensive linemen, you'll be the, uh, with, with Jim, Coach Jim over at the slip. And let's do it. And the nice thing about that is that I was able to get the team on the field as football players. 
versus a bunch of 15 year olds playing I touched you last. So, so that, that, that sounds like uh, uh, putting both yourself and you know your 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 athletes into a mental state uh, where they're receptive to you know technical information and uh, ready to. It's almost like priming them to perform. Uh, that, so so that uh, when we're actually doing the thing that we do, we're not mentally sort of incidentally distracted by things that we were you know carrying into the building with us. That. It was a that was such an influential thing that happened to me that when I I took that concept into track and field throwers practice and my goal was to have practice only last one hour and so we meet in the weight room and I had a specific weight room workout they did called the transformation program three days a week two days a week we did some more we did medicine ball work and the idea is that at three fifty nine fifty nine everyone was leaving. And by disciplining them to this one hour a day, total discus focus, all those kids are now professors, lawyers, doctors. It, it was an academically strong school. But we also have the national champion in that, that group, nine straight discus champion doing that. But what it taught me is that when it's time to go, it's time to go. And you need to have that gear change happen when they, you guys call it a dojo? Uh, when, academy, dojo, there's a lot of words, but yeah, okay. gym. When I come into the academy, I've already made the click. I'm clicked as I walked in. I don't need more time to you know, play grab ass. And I'm here. I'm here. And yeah. boy, I because and, and by the way, from that group I just told you about, that, that, that nine or ten year period, that's when I learned the now what principles. And, and what we kept doing with, okay, you didn't do well at this meet. What happened? Well, coach, okay, so we need to do more this in the training. Yes. Yeah, okay. So we need to practice one throw. We need, and all of a sudden these other tools started to appear for me. Um, and then, you know, I, I don't know how long you guys, you guys do your thing, but I would be interested for you guys to video it and just see how much time you waste. Uh, right, try I, half hour session sometime, 20 minute session, 15 minute session. Michael, if you only had 15 minutes, what would you do? However, you answer that question is what you should be focusing on. Yeah, that it's, makes uh, a lot of sense. Game, change, game changing way to think as a coach. Game changing. Uh, well, with that, I think uh, we've probably, uh, probably. You know, come to a place where we should wrap up. Uh, if some folks want, you know, aren't like me and just complete Dan John sycophants, uh, wanted to find out about you and uh, learn more uh, personally, just on the on the whole here, I can recommend Dan's books as an author. I've read not all of them, but uh, like more than four uh, that I can count off. You know, just thinking off, I'm a huge fan, and all the the T Nation articles uh, they're foundational to me. Well, the two uh, best places to go, if you go to danjohn.net, that is that is where I keep my archive. So in there, you'll find uh, all the Get Up newsletters. If you decide to print it off, you better buy a lot of paper. Uh, Three thousand pieces of paper to print everything off. That's all free. There's a book on discus throwing. There's a book on weightlifting. There's a book on raising kids. And then there's Dan John University, which is free for two weeks, uh, just when you just go in. And in there, you'll get all my most recent articles. Uh, uh, I think there's 14 downloadable, I wouldn't call them books, but bigger things. Well, Pat Flynn has contributed. Uh, uh, Tim Anderson's contributed. You know, it's just, I'm just trying to put a, a library of resources on the So in resources, there's podcasts, these downloadable books and essays. We have a magnificent forum. And then we got that workout generator, which I think when Brian showed it to me, it scared me because the dude was inside my brain. It is how my brain works, literally how my brain works. And I can't do better uh, programming than the, than the generator. I can't because it is my work, but my synapses aren't as fast as those spreadsheets and computers. <laughs> now I'm smart, but yeah. <laughs> like it's it. You literally press a button and you get all five days workouts, all five workouts of the week, 
boom, right there. And if you don't like this exercise, you just can press it and you get a menu of other choices. I look at that thing as like, oh my God, I wish I had this as a kid, you know, but mm -hmm. I had to grow up and invent it, I guess. So that's <laughs> the two. And then uh, if, if you have people on the Instagrams, I'm Coach Dan John there, okay? And I put up videos almost every single day on Instagram and YouTube too. So like I just finished doing uh, one rep for you as well. Yeah. So uh, uh, for my listeners, hey, if you are uh, enjoying the content, which if you made it this far, you did. Yeah. Uh, that you clearly care about strength and, and longevity and uh, athletic performance. Give us a, a like and a share uh, and a subscribe and smash all those little buttons and bells that uh, helps us out. It does make a difference. And the bigger I can build this network, the more folks uh, like Dan that we can get uh, to come join us and uh, share you know, great ideas and, and their years and years of expertise with us. And bring me back. Bring me back. Let's do it again. We definitely want to bring you back. Uh, I will straight spam you. I'm that kind of guy. <laughs> hey, well, thanks for the opportunity, okay? Absolutely.